Okay. Um, hi, I'm Kirsty Meddings. I'm going to spend five minutes or so talking about Crossmark and Fundref. Um, we've had a bit of trouble. We're jumping around machines because we had a bit of trouble with the presentations and my notes have vanished, but I think that's okay. We can, uh, we can work with it. Um, so starting with Crossmark. Um, Crossmark's seen really nice steady growth over the last um, two and a half years or so since it was launched. We just passed um, a bit of a landmark in September, a million Crossmark deposits, and when I checked the number last week, we're standing at 1.17 million Crossmark deposits, which is great. Um, within those 1 million deposits, 14,000 of them contain status updates, so a significant change to the status of the content, a correction, a retraction, something similar like that. And we now have 57 publishers participating in Crossmark, which is also really good news. The big change, um, and really the main thing I'm just going to tell you about today for Crossmark, is that we have decided to narrow down the number of things that we can call a status update. So if you remember, we've always said from the very start of Crossmark that in order to trigger a status update, the change to the content has to be significant enough to affect the crediting or the interpretation of the work. So this isn't minor changes, it's not typos, it's not anything like that. It's something that is going to be important enough to flag to the reader to say, you need to see this because it impacts the essential meaning of this piece of content. Um, a few things, really. What we found is that um, there really are a, a limited number of things within our area of publishing that you can that fall into this definition. So we had lots of long conversations with the Crosscheck Committee, which is made up of members participating publishers in Crossref, and we went and looked at what people have been depositing so far, um, and we narrowed it down to these, I think it's 12, 12 um, status updates that we believe cover um, all the actions that could happen to content that will affect the crediting or interpretation of the work. Um, what we also found, looking at what's already been deposited, is that the vast majority of deposits to date have been one of these things or a very slight variation on it. Um, so really what we're doing here is we're not really changing anything about Crossmark, but we're kind of formalising the best practices. And so we're updating the schema, the new schema that came out last week that I think Chuck's already referred to. Um, is changed slightly so that it only accepts these as the update type within a Crossmark deposit. Um, previous schemas are still being used, so if you're depositing Crossmark at the moment in the old way, that's absolutely fine. Um, we're going to look sometime in 2015 to force a move up to the new schema um, to make this kind of law, if you like. So at that point, if you deposit a Crossmark um, update with another type than these 12, the deposit will be rejected. In another slight tweak, we're also, at the moment in Crossmark, there is a space for you to label your update type. We're taking that out just because basically these are what they say, so we're just inferring the label from the, um, from the update type that's within the, within the deposit. So this is in place now. If you move it to the new schema now, you can um, start to deposit with these and leave the label out by early next year, and we'll keep reminding people. We've sent email out already to all Crossmark publishers saying that they need to be aware of this. But as I say, for the vast majority of Crossmark participants, it's really no change. You're already using these terms, and it's just kind of business as usual. Uh, the other reason we're doing this, there's just a little bit of the background for it, um, aside from the fact that we want to kind of just make sure that these minor updates don't creep in and run the risk of diluting the Crossmark message, it also means that we can do much better analysis. So if we've got everyone using the same terms, then it makes it much easier for us to see exactly how many retractions, corrections, that kind of thing are coming in. So if everyone uses the same vocabulary, um, that makes that much easier for us to do. I'm not actually going to talk about this very much because Jeffrey covered it this morning, but this is kind of the other news for Crossmark, which is the pilot that we're about to start on for link clinical trials. We're just in the process of building the prototype, which will be, I think Jeffrey showed at the front end for sending a little link to authors saying, can you tell us about the trials you reference in this paper? Um, we're hoping to get the pilot running around January time, um, and then we'll be reporting back on that next year. Um, it's not a new... It's not a new service, it's kind of a feature app within Crossmark, um, but quite an interesting one, I think, and the publishers who are working with us on that, I think, are quite excited about it. So that's all for Crossmark. Moving on to Fundref. Um, again, really nice growth in Fundref. We've got 26 publishers depositing funding data now from 4,000 titles, um, 350,000 deposits to date, and Fundref launched... Um, a little over a year ago, wasn't it? So not bad, not bad going there. Really been growing in um, the last few months particularly. I'll touch on the registry in a minute. But the thing I really wanted to talk about with Fundref um, is this kind of divide in the graph here. What you're looking at here is the blue line is the total number of Fundref deposits, which has shot up, which is brilliant. I mean, we're really, we're really pleased to see it going up there. 
Um, but as I hope you're aware, the key thing about FundRef is it's all about normalizing that funding data, making sure that it's matched up with funder names and IDs in the FundRef registry before it's deposited with Crossmark. The bottom green line is the number of FundRef deposits that have come in with a funder ID in them. Um, so a little bit concerning, it's great to see the growth, but a little bit concerning we're getting so many deposits come in that have funder names but no funder ID from the registry in them. Um, obviously there could be a number of reasons for this. I'm going to show you a graph about the registry in a minute which is also growing nice and steadily. So we're not entirely convinced that all of those deposits without IDs don't have IDs because they're not in the registry. We think maybe there's something else going on there. And I've been starting a process of talking to individual publishers to find out why there are so many of these coming in, see what we can do to help. Um, to that end, we have done a couple of things. We've got an API that we released maybe six months ago now that allows you to poll, if you know deposits that have already come in with names but no ID, to poll them against the registry and we'll bring back suggestions for funders that could match that, that you could then insert the IDs and re-enter them. And we've just been talking in the last couple of weeks as well about making reports available so that you can pull back a list of those DOIs that have got funding names but not funder IDs with a view to re-polling them and redepositing them. Because really what's critical here is that without an ID, the fund ref, funder ID ties all of this information together and in funder ref search or in our search API, things won't appear unless they're tied with a funder ID. So it's absolutely critical that everyone's doing everything they can to make sure that before deposit, if the funder exists in the registry, it's matched up and added to that deposit. And as I said, the registry is growing really nicely. Um, it's being updated monthly. We've had two months, I think, this year. Didn't get an update in October and July also um, when there was some other work going on. But for the most part, it's updated monthly. We're getting between 500 and 800 new funders in every month, um, growing uh, both through the names that we're getting in from publishers depositing, but also we've had a lot of good interactions with specific publishers who've sent us lists of funders in their area, and also funders themselves who've got in touch and said, look, my organization needs to be added to the registry. So it's almost doubled in size um, since November 14 to 8,000. We know there's still a long way to go, and that probably accounts for quite a chunk of those um, deposits without funder IDs in them. But there's a lot of data in there, and for almost all of the funders, or for certainly for a, a very large chunk of them, there are alternate names listed in the registry, and there are also acronyms listed. So we're trying as hard as we can to make sure that, you know, these things are discoverable, that authors searching, or if you're searching yourselves for the, for the um, funder names, that there are various ways that you can find them. And I think that, rather quickly, brings me to the end of the update on those two things. <laughs>